on that Resurrection Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead, um, people were grieving too. Terrible, terrible murder that took place. And, uh, and even though he rose from the dead, a lot didn't believe it of his disciples. And I want to share a couple of moments on uh, transforming grace. Our series has been called Amazing Grace. And, um, and there were two confused followers of Jesus. You can read the story in Luke 24. Um, these men were probably part of the 120 or the 70. So there, there were 12 disciples. Then Jesus had a group of 70. And then on, in the upper room uh, on the day of Pentecost, there were 120. But they were obviously following him and uh, serving him. And they, they, they had heard everything. They'd heard him talk about his impending death and resurrection and continuing ministry and the message to take the good news of salvation to the whole world. But their grief blinded them from the reality. I shared last Sunday, Easter Sunday, how Mary Magdalene, how she went to the tomb with spices to help embalm his body. She was not expecting him to rise from the dead. And when Jesus appeared, she thought it was the gardener. She so wasn't expecting. So, so she was shocked when he said, Gee, Mary, it's me. Well, these two men, um, one named Cleopas, they're walking to a town outside Jerusalem, fearful, uncertain, confused. Uh, people scattered in Jerusalem because they thought maybe the authorities would start killing a lot of others as well. Um, and so they're downcast and they're walking and then Jesus turns up. He walks with them. And as he walks with them, it, it, uh, uh, it's interesting, it says in verse 16, but God kept them from recognizing him. God kept them from recognizing him. And it's an interesting scripture. Um, why would God prevent these two men from instantly recognizing him? Good question, eh? You would think they're downcast, they're depressed. Jesus might just turn up and go, hey, boys, it's me. Hey, I've risen. It's me. And, and they would have fallen at their feet and worship, at his feet and worshipped and, and, uh, and been thoroughly enthused and revived and encouraged. And then he would have disappeared and, and they probably would have come to their senses. And said, what was that all about? Was it really him? Was it not him? They had an experience. But the Lord prevented them from recognizing him. And I think the reason why, the only reason I can think of is, is what happens now when he's among them. I think it's because their faith in Jesus was not based on, on a correct reading of the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, on a sound interpretation of what the scriptures actually taught. They got some things right, but they got other things terribly wrong. And so the Lord, uh, for example, they said this. This is their interpretation of Jesus in verse 19 to 21. So Jesus is talking to them and, and they go, well, haven't you heard what has happened in Jerusalem? You know about Jesus? And he's walking among them. And he goes, well, tell me more. <laughs> and he says, well, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. All true. But the next part is false. Their reading of the Old Testament, they read into this. This wasn't the correct interpretation. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Though these men had been walking with Jesus... They listened to his teaching. They still didn't get it. They had some facts that were right. You know, the what's, they, they got that right, but they didn't grasp the why behind the what <laughs> and the reason for his death and the reason for his resurrection. It was so that he could save people from the consequences of their sin. It was not about defeating the Roman authorities, the colonial power and setting up God's kingdom here on earth. That's what they were anticipating. They were misreading the scripture. And this was a common misconception in Jesus' day. So his disciples, 
uh, thought this as well. The population thought, I thought, well, you know, we've been conquered by the Greeks, we've been conquered by the Romans. Or earlier, you know, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and uh, then Alexander the Great, and then the Caesars. And so they're, they're, they're hopeful, this Messiah. So what was happening is, as they're reading the Old Testament, they've got blinkers on. They're reading it from their own needs and their own situation. They're not actually reading the scripture as it was meant to be interpreted. Um, I mean, I, when I was a child, I saw the film King of Kings. Remember that film? One of the first ones with Jeffrey Hunter, you know, the blue-eyed blonde Jesus or red hair, you know, such a handsome dude. And uh, now I look at it and go, oh man, that's Hollywood. But at the end, I remember only a little kid, this is the 1960s, I really felt sad. I thought, wow, why didn't you beat them up, Jesus? You know, why didn't you just get rid of the Romans and, and, and why did you have to die? So, so even as a child, and a lot of, lot of people even today say, well, if he really was God's son, why didn't he inaugurate his kingdom then and there? Why didn't he just defeat the Romans and deal with Satan and, and set up his eternal kingdom? They missed the whole point that God's mission was to send his son to die in our place so that we could be forgiven of our sins and be restored back to the Father and that his kingdom was a kingdom of love. It wasn't a kingdom of power. It wasn't a kingdom of coercion. It was a kingdom of persuasion to encourage people to see who he is and to believe upon him and to voluntarily receive him. He will return one day, but not now. Now is the time where the gospel is to be presented to the whole world, to all the nations. So, uh, so I, can't, I can't be too harsh on these guys because I felt the same as well as a little kid. You see, knowledge is important, but to experience saving faith by God's grace, we need spiritual revelation. We need the eyes of our heart enlightened to really see the truth of Scripture. And so Jesus now spends considerable time, interesting, and it would have taken, I think, a couple of hours giving these two downcast souls the right view of the Christ from the Scriptures. You think, why bother Jesus? Just say, hey, it's me, boys. Come on, I've got to go else. I'm busy. I've got to go somewhere else to see some other discouraged souls. No, he actually takes the time and he does a Bible study with them. Starting in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. All the historical books, all the prophets. He goes through it and he explains this. He, goes, he said to them, first of all, he goes, oh, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I mean, what a Bible study. That would have been the greatest Bible study of all times. See, Jesus wanted their faith to be grounded in the scriptures and not their particular view of certain passages. We've just completed 40 days of prayer. And one of the things that, that we've endeavoured to build into you is read the scripture correctly, write down messages. In fact, I'd love you to have a notebook and take down my messages when I preach or Nathan or whoever. And so study the scriptures. Become Berean, you know. The Bereans really studied the scriptures to make sure that you get a correct interpretation of, of the word. And so... He wanted their, their faith to be grounded in the whole Old Testament and not just their particular views or perspectives about certain passages. Their faith could not be based solely, hear me on this one too, on their personal experience of Jesus because we all have blinkers on. They walked with him, they talked with him, they ate with him for, for say a couple of years. But they had biases. They had their own reflections about him. And so subjectivism is not, you know, it, we can be too subjective. Our faith must be centred on objective truth and not subjective my truth. You know, today it's like, well, it's my story and it's my truth. You know, who said, well, it's my truth. It may not be factual. It may not be the truth. Oh, well, it's my truth. Well, we're not into my truth so much. We're into the truth, the truth about Jesus. So it's not my interpretation of Jesus. It's actually not my story. It's his story. And uh, 
Uh, and, and so when insight from the Bible about the Jesus of the New Testament, the prophesied Messiah of the Old Testament, when it grips us, revelation from the Holy Spirit comes and, and it births saving faith in us to be able to receive Jesus' transforming grace. In Mark 7, 13, um, you know, the traditional views of, of people nullifies the gospel, Jesus said. And this is why he said this. He goes, you, you nullify the word of God by your tradition, by holding on to human traditions. And it's easy for us. I know people that read the Bible. They have no idea of Jesus saving grace. They have no idea of who he really is. I, I was at university and we had a professor uh, teaching us religious studies. He had three PhDs. He was a really smart dude. Very clear. In fact, I liked him. I learned a lot from him. But I wrote, a, I wrote an essay on the death and resurrection of Christ. I thought it was a pretty good essay. And I basically uh, read several books and, and articles and gave the proofs for the resurrection because he was presenting it like the disciples were hallucinating. They were so expecting him to rise from the dead that they you know, lost contact with reality and he appeared to them. Oh, yes, Jesus appeared because they were so anticipating him. And I'm thinking, that's not what I read in the scripture. They weren't anticipating him to rise. They weren't expecting him to rise. They had to be convinced against their will. So I wrote all the proofs, you know, sort of forensically, legally, I got a couple of lawyers' books, who had, had lawyers who had got converted as they looked at the evidence. Well, he got mad at me. He wouldn't mark the paper. And I still remember him saying, this is not an academic paper. Because you, you, you have gone onto the attack. I still remember him saying, you've got a siege mentality. Instead of reasoning this through, you've gone for the attack. I'm thinking, what have I done? Attack about what? You know what I attacked was the falsehoods, the, the, the demythologizing of Rudolf Bultmann, who used to read the New Testament, this great German scholar, and, um, and he would say, well, we're going to take all the miracles out, take all the miracles out, all the miraculous, and I call it the demythologizing. So let's look at the Jesus of history, not the Christ of faith. What a bunch of baloney. And, uh, and so, so I just refused to be a Bultmannite. I wasn't into demythologizing. I'm just saying, I just accept the text as it is. And so he really attacked me on that one and I had to rewrite my paper. And uh, I think I've got a C. Deserved to be a distinction. Uh, but I never forgot that. I still got the paper, can you believe it? And um, so, but you see, people hold on to their traditions, how they view things. And Jesus said, look, you can nullify God's word. You can nullify God's word by not reading it correctly, by not interpreting it soundly, by not examining your own biases and letting it be a true mirror to speak to you. And so that's why he spent the time with these guys. And so in verse 31, 32, it says, Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts strangely warmed, actually, in, in one translation, burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? I mean, that's an understatement of the year. Weren't our hearts strangely warm? Their hearts were ablaze. They got on fire. Why? Because the word of God was being presented honestly, openly, truthfully, all the facts. And so zeal came into their lives. They realized something was happening. The Holy Spirit was moving on the inside. When we truly see Jesus as the saviour who is full of grace and truth and we place our faith in him, transformation occurs and we become bold in our witness of him. When we are changed like these two guys, we cannot help but to communicate this to others. And this is exactly what they did. Have a look at this, what they did. These guys, they go straight back into the furnace. These downcast, fearful men go back into the murderous atmosphere in Jerusalem and they testify. It says they got up and returned at once, no hesitation, to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together saying, it's true, it's true, it's all true. <laughs> the Lord has risen and he did appear to Peter. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread and he broke bread with them and they recognised him. And you see here how amazing grace is, how transforming it is. And so what would possess these guys to go back 
into a murderous atmosphere. The authorities in Sri Lanka are saying, do not have churches today. Our churches are going to go ahead. Pastor Som is running his service. They've said that. They're not going to be intimidated. That's bravery. That's confidence. It's like we're not going to stop the worship of Jesus. We're not going to. And uh, others are stopping. So the authorities said, mosques, churches, synagogues, stop. Don't do anything until we catch all these murder and scoundrels. But our guys are going ahead. Boldness, faith, they say no, and they're witnessing. And I think where we are in Colombo, I think by them doing that, the whole community is going to see that these people are different. They are bold. I mean, they'll take security measures. There's a big wall right around the facility, which is great. I'm sure they'll do that. But so here we see that these men that were transformed, how were they transformed? From unbelief, confusion, by dealing with their false views of Scripture. They've got a correct view of Scripture. By their biases being challenged and that they then could see effectively. And as the Scriptures are opened up, their hearts are warmed and they are changed. They had to be changed to want to go back into that environment to testify. Folks, there's no shortcuts to, to receiving transforming grace. How we got saved is how we not just stay saved, but continue to grow. It's through God's word. And as we face up to our, our prejudices, our biases, how we, sometimes we read scripture and we think, oh, that's too hard. That's a hard saying. And we don't let it penetrate. It's an inconvenient. Some truths are really inconvenient. They're too challenging. But to let the word speak to us, to reveal our sin, to reveal who Christ really is, and as, as we do that and humble ourselves, grace comes. The Holy Spirit will warm our hearts. Grace comes. God's free unmerited favour to change us, to transform us, and, to, and, and it's evidenced by empowering us to be effective witnesses. I had some people say to me, they invited people to come to church, and they didn't come. I invited someone, and they didn't come as well. And, and I'm, I'm thankful, at least I had the courage to invite them. And I said, good on you for doing that. I said, they, they didn't despise and say, well, I'm not going to come because... No, you've got relationship with them, but we've got to be bold. We've got to be courageous and to invite people and to testify of who he is. Because when we're transformed by his grace, we cannot help but want to testify and share. Let's stand together. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the Easter story that we've examined over the past few weeks and on Good Friday and Easter Sunday and this morning, these two guys on the road to Emmaus, thank you that we see lessons there for us. Help us, Lord. Help us to identify our prejudices, our biases, our limited perspective. And help us to submit to your word as we read it, as we reflect it, reflect on it, that we let you speak to us. And Lord, as, as we do that, we know that your Holy Spirit will enable us and that there will be power, transforming power that comes within, that reveals itself that we want to testify, we want to communicate to others. So Lord, for all of us in this Easter season, help us to be people whose faith is secured in Jesus because we have a revelation an understanding of who Jesus is, what he has done, what he is continuing to do, and how he works his spirit of grace in and through us. Empower us, transform us, and, and help us to be powerful witnesses, not just at Easter time, but to testify at work this week with our neighbours, with our family, to let the world know. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.